the lawyers both said, we, we don't think you should put that in there. And they said, Sergeant Major, what do you think? I said, well, if you don't start giving your NCOs some authority and you don't back them with this regulation, don't blame them when things go wrong. You know, if something goes bad, I don't want to hear anything about NCOs because you give them no authority. Welcome to the Mops and Most podcast. I'd imagine, hopefully, because of the title of this episode and the guests we have on, we might have some new listeners. And if so, welcome. For those of you that have been with us for a long time, welcome back. Drew and Alex here. You know, it's interesting because about a year ago, Alex and I decided that we were going to buy microphones and start talking into them, hoping that maybe we could have something worthwhile to listen to with regards to human performance. I don't really know if we ever expected to have, well, one, have guests outside of our close network, but just guests that have made a big difference in their field. And I think this week is is probably the the culmination of a lot of that in the sense that we have the sergeant major of the army the recently retired sergeant major of the army talking to us on our podcast about issues that we probably couldn't even begin to conceptualize at the level that he's at so alex i'll turn it over to you to introduce our new friend tony yeah so you guys might know him as sergeant major of the army retired michael grinston Um, he now signs his emails tony if you're wondering Tony is a native of Jasper, Alabama. He enlisted in the Army in October of 1987 and attended his basic training in AIT as an artilleryman at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Across his career, he served at every leadership level available to an enlisted member of the United States Army, from cannon crew member all the way up to sergeant major of the Army. His list of deployments is pretty stout as well. Operation Desert Storm, Desert Shield, Iraqi Freedom, New Dawn, Inherent Resolve, Enduring Freedom, and Kosovo. He served as the 1st Infantry Division Command Sergeant Major, the 1st Corps Command Sergeant Major, uh, the Force Com Command Sergeant Major, and in his terminal position, which he just retired from three months ago, the Sergeant Major of the Army. Uh, He's been to every single level of NCOES. He is a graduate of Ranger School, Airborne School, Drill Sergeant School, Air Assault School. The How the Army Runs course, which some of you guys might not have heard of unless you're deep in the bureaucratic side of the Army, but that is a course I'm glad I never went to. Equal Opportunity Leaders course and the Keystone course. He's got a bachelor's in business administration from the University of Maryland University College. And I'm not even going to read this whole list of awards. He's got a lot. You guys can look it up. (laughs) And I guess for those of you that aren't maybe familiar with the army or wouldn't consider yourself army adjacent sergeant major of the army is is literally as high as you can go as an enlisted service member so i think most people are familiar with one stars two stars three stars four star generals the equivalent to that on on the enlisted side is like we said sergeant major of the army so you know when, when you bring guests like this on there's always a little bit of apprehension around how much are they going to be willing to talk about? What sort of questions are they going to be willing to answer? And and will it be kind of the same pre-planned canned response that we we tend to hear from folks that are 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 in the thick of it? I think both Alex and I unequivocally can tell you, and and hopefully you you gain from listening to this conversation, Tony, which still feels weird to say, but Tony was incredibly forthcoming. I mean, we've been really curious to get to the bottom of a lot of these issues. We talk about AFIs, which again, for those of you that are unfamiliar, is is kind of the fast food and and quickie mart services that are on military installations. We talk about nutrition. We talk about uh, holistic health and fitness and just kind of embedded human performance in general. And, And then we also kind of asked him straight up, like, what are some of your biggest regrets? Where do you think that you missed the mark? Where do you think that you would have liked to have done more? And I think if his answers don't surprise you, hopefully the genuineness with which he comes across in those answers kind of catches you off guard because I think we both walked away from this thinking really very highly of of, of this individual as, as a leader, but also just as a person. And I'll say Drew took a moment there to reflect before we went into the normal intro stuff. So I'll take a moment here to reflect real briefly. Sometimes episodes we make do really well and are super popular. Sometimes episodes don't do as well and aren't as popular, but I've had friends remind me going through this process, whether it goes to the moon or whether it peters out, whatever it is. I'm honestly just pretty grateful for all the conversations we've been able to have across the course of this thing. We've been able to get people on here to have a conversation that I don't think I ever would have had the opportunity to have a one-on-one with without a platform like this. 
And this is definitely one of those instances where this conversation was really cool. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to have been able to host it. And I hope you guys get as much out of it as I know I did. Hopefully you did as well, Drew. Yeah. So without any further ado, here's Tony. Hey guys, before we kick this episode off, just wanted to give a quick plug to the two options that we have for folks interested in training with us. We have the team-based long and strong program. And then if you are interested in a more engaging, intensive, uh, more tailored option, we offer one-on-one coaching as well. And you can find both of those on the training tab of our website, mopsandmoes.com. And if it's the team training you're interested, click that link and you will find a one-week free trial. So again, if any of the things that we talk about on this podcast are interesting to you as far as training goes, head to the website like Alex just mentioned, select that training tab and follow the instructions from there. Enjoy the episode. This might be a cliche question to kick off with, but given that you just came off of your tenure as Sergeant Major of the Army, what looking back, what are some things that you would have liked to see implemented that you that you maybe either couldn't achieve or, or couldn't take to the fruition that you wanted to take it to? I think I had a long list of stuff. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, you never get finished. Uh, I think that's the good news about the army is like I had these, you know, literally I had a list of things that you know, hey, I hope you can get this done. Part of that was, you know, going back and you know, trying to figure out all this legislative on them. Army combat fitness test. I came out pretty hard when somebody said, Oh, we're going back. I said, Well, you know, I'd, I'd equate that to, you might as well go get the, you know, M1 grand rifle and let's start using that again, too. So let's not go up the, to go back to the APFT. So um, to, to get that finished. Um, but I also had a list of other things that, uh, you know, the Army really, you know, Mike Weimer had to work on and it wasn't just fitness. Um, really, one of the things, was nutrition mm-hmm. i just you know i wish i had you know another four years to finish with the defects we were trying this pilot and i didn't get it finished where i wanted soldiers to go eat anywhere on the base mm-hmm. like a like a like a campus style feeding and they would have tickets they wouldn't get money they would just say hey i want to go eat in the commissary i want to go eat at uh panera bread i don't think we have a panera bed on on an installation yet but I wanted to get that implemented where you could just eat and you wouldn't just have to go to the defect. Mm-hmm. It could be a commissary, maybe uh, some of the places in APs, healthy nutrition, or maybe it is somewhere else uh, across the installation. We had the pilot, we're almost there. We were working through OSD and funding and all that, but I didn't get it done. <laughs> so mm-hmm. um, you probably don't have enough time for all the things that didn't get done. But <laughs> that's just the way I think it was supposed to operate. I was supposed to push to the end, and and if I got something finished, I should start something new. Mm-hmm. So uh, I left Mike Weimer a big long list of stuff <laughs> so, uh, uh, for him to do. So, but th- that's just a couple. So you've you've opened the door to the nutrition and APHES conversation, which I think is a rabbit hole. Drew and I are happy to go down. But before we go that direction, I do want to ask a quick question and see if what I've heard is true or not. I have seen people assign blame to you for the leg tuck going away from the ACFT. And we here at Mops and Moe's are the, the home of leg tuck nation. We're pretty passionate about it. Is it true that you fought hard to keep the leg tuck while you were SMA? A hundred percent. I'm not going to tell you who took it out, but uh, I'll tell you. <laughs> it wasn't you. It was not me. I still do leg tucks every Tuesday um, and I'm almost officially retired. I think it's, people just sometimes don't know how to read either. They read what they want, right? So if you look at the report from Rand and they talked about valid and invalid, you know, but people don't understand how to read the Rand study. They just, oh, it's invalid. No, that's not true. What it said was it was invalid because if you couldn't do a leg tuck, Mm -hmm. it's hard to validate that you have, you know, any core stomach muscles. So if you don't have the grip strength in the upper body, uh, to do a leg tuck, then it's hard to evaluate. Do you have any core? So, but when you look at the chart, I think it was on page 11 and 12. That's how many times I read that Rand study. It's been a while too. <laughs> it shows there was a coefficient, like what's a really good exercise. 
And that was, it rated higher than the plank because it's a multi-component exercise. It does upper body, it does core strength, it does grip strength. So I still do it. I'm not going to quit because I like multiple component exercises to work more muscle groups. It just means I have to do less or exercises if I work more parts of the body. So I promise, uh, I promise nobody in the army fought harder uh, to keep the leg. Tight. <laughs> I um, love that. <laughs> I wouldn't say insubordinate, but it was vindicated. <laughs> All right. That, that makes me feel good. I know we won't go too nerdy on the leg tuck and the, test event selection do not here, set alex we, loose on leg tucks please we did a whole episode with dr east who i'm sure you've had plenty of chats about the acft with oh yeah he and i we we go way back with dr east yeah <laughs> awesome i gotta ask an afi's question to you because it's something that has come up quite a bit on this podcast both from folks we've had on and then just i guess kind of discussion around some of the episodes specific to nutrition because like you mentioned that is one of the biggest I mean, no pun intended here, but like some of the lowest hanging fruit when we think about soldier health and well-being. And it just, it seems like from an outsider's perspective that you've got a lot of time, effort, energy, and resources dedicated to embedded human performance staffs, bringing in subject matter experts to sort of right the ship when we think about lethality and readiness. But simultaneously, a lot of time, energy, effort, and resources being invested in this kind of independent entity that is AFES. And you go into any installation across the country, maybe even across the world, you see fast food, you see options that kind of contradict what soldiers are being taught by the folks that the army is investing to put in place. So I just, I'm, there's not really a question there. I'm just curious from your position and where you were at, how do you navigate those two things? Because it seems like a bit of a dichotomy. Yeah, it's a, it's actually not for me. Uh, and I think it's just something you don't realize until you talk to me. Um, believe it or not, I put a lot of energy. It's probably not as much as I did for the ACFT, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's it's a close second on the amount of energy I did to right size uh, food and how we fuel our bodies in the army. Mm -hmm. um, most people don't know, and why would you unless you do it? But I, for four years, I held a worldwide uh, warrant officer, every senior warrant that was in charge of an installation for a defect we had a meeting once a quarter <laughs> and I started grading them and then I would go out and they would say, Oh, our defect's great. And I said, actually it's not. <laughs> and then they get all mad. Um, so we have this forum where we really tried to change how we do food and uh, it's just really hard. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, it's, I thought the ACFT was hard. It, so it was trying to change the culture of food. Like one of the things I said, and I didn't get completely done, but I said, I want, every dining facility in the army to offer not just a to-go plate, uh, but a meal prep program. Mm -hmm. uh, this started at uh, Fort Liberty and I, I ordered a food online. It was nutritious. It said, here's how much protein you're getting and here's how much you need. We got this from the Thor three program where you can actually go online, order your food ahead of time and it will have your name on it. And at Fort Liberty, you would get your meal. So that was one of the things we're doing the, to, with the, the defects or the dining facilities or uh, warrior restaurants. We've got like four names for them, but <laughs> that's just one of many things we're trying to do. And, but your question was about AFES and maybe there's fast food. So here's my philosophy. Life's about choices. And I don't think it's my job to eliminate, you know, a bad choice. What I want to do is make you so informed that you choose wisely, but maybe you want a cheeseburger. Then I don't want to take away all cheeseburgers because you'll just, you know, if you want a cheeseburger, you'll just get mad at me because you want a cheeseburger. But what I want to do is say, you're so well informed, you're going to choose the right food. The right food is on the installation. The wrong food's on there too, but that's life, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't take away all bad things in the world. It's like, yeah, but we hope that you don't choose to do this. And then, you know, I, I said, well, people would get mad and said, well, we just get rid of all the Burger Kings. It's like, okay, well, I want to do that. It's because Burger King doesn't want to operate on a base because people don't go there. Mm -hmm. But our soldiers are still making that choice. So we got to really educate them on the proper choices um, but I don't want to eliminate it because I think that's just, 
I think, you know, then it's like, oh, I can't believe you did that or I'll just go there anyway. So that's my philosophy, especially on nutrition with aphids. You know, I sit on the board for aphids and I really wanted to bring in more healthy choices. And we, mm-hmm. and that's like I said, I we didn't get there. I'm not saying Panera Bread's the, the end all do all healthy choices, but having a few more of those options available on the installations, we were really working through that whole program, not just it's all of it. It's uh, AFES, it's the commissary, it's uh, the, the warrior restaurants. It's how do you get, you know, nutritious fast food from any of those locations. So that whole ecosystem was what I was working on. And um, like I said, uh, I thought we were getting a little better, but uh, I didn't completely get that finished. Hmm. So I'm going to, I'm going to push back a little bit. And first I'll say that I've eaten at like at least 30 or 40 defects across the army at this point. And I think the food is better than a lot of people claim it is. I was pretty happy 95% of the time. And more affordable. And in much more affordable. Mm-hmm. I'll say that too. But where, where there's some challenge, I think is, and people talk a lot about choice architecture and nutrition, what we make available, how accessible it is, what we put in a stand close to the cash register, stuff like that. And when I look at the choice architecture of food on an installation, the DFAC is open from like eight to nine, and then from like 1130 to one ish, and like dinner hours tend to be on the early side. And then the shopette with the tornadoes and the dip and the energy drinks is open 24 seven. And it, it seems like there's easier access and faster access to the things we'd rather they not have. And I, I think we're moving in the right direction with meal prep and meal prep seems to follow H2F wherever it goes. Once H2F teams are in place, people start asking for meal prep. So that's a really good sign, I think. But the, the choice architecture we've set up means that if somebody's working night shift or has a busy day and misses meal times and things like that, and like countless places, I saw a lot of soldiers at JBLM getting off at 11 and the DFAC didn't open till 1130 for lunch. So they just go to Burger King by default. I think, I, I don't know, again, not really a question more of like, a, these are the concerns I'm worried about, but is there a world where DFACs are open the same hours as dining at AFI's restaurants? I don't know. Yeah. You know, I, d- I did read the book about choice architecture. <laughs> uh, choice architecture normally says where you put things. Um mm-hmm. You know, if I'm going to get gas and then I get the Snickers bar at the counter, yep. um, you drove to or you drove to Burger King. So I don't think that's choice architecture. <laughs> I think <laughs> uh, I'll push back to <laughs> but um, And I like pushback, by the way. Um, I've read the book. It's a really good book. You know, if you put all the vegetables up front, you uh, and I've said I'm really more concerned about choice architecture in our defect. Put the the cake. That shouldn't be the first thing before the salad. Now that we can control. And, you know, and I've talked to like all the defense managers and if they have it, you know, I usually just tell them to move it because that does matter. But, you know, if I drove to Burger King, I'm probably going to get Burger King. I don't care where I put it. (laughs) You know what I mean? You're driving there. So a little bit on the choice architecture part, but I agree on the opening hours, but you're in this, we're in this death spiral, right? You know, um, it's like uh, I open it, you don't come, so I, I lose money. <laughs> and he's like, I want it open all the time. It's like, okay, well, I can do that, but then you don't show up. It, it, remember, it's life choices. You know, I can open it. You know, we looked at this with childcare. Um, you know, everybody's like, oh, we want 24 hour childcare. It's great. Well, I can spend a million dollars for one child because that's how many people were at Fort Sill at the childcare, you know, early in the morning. So we said, well, we, it's not cost efficient. We had to shut the childcare. So um, what we're trying to do with the D, the dining facility, that's why it's a little bit of commissary. And I, I don't know when, uh, the last time you've been at commissary, but man, that sushi bar is really good. <laughs> so, I'm a sushi baby. <laughs> I'm, I'm all about the commissary sandwiches myself. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's a little bit about having that's a really good healthy choice that could be open at eleven. Of which would save us maybe some money because we bring in all the cooks, we bring in all the folks, and then that one person, you know, goes to the to the warrior restaurant. That's why I was trying to work on the whole system about if you know you got an option mm-hmm. right now, you only had the option to drive to Burger King at eleven. I want you to have the option not to go to Burger King, but go to the commissary, get the sandwich, get a sushi, get a salad. There are pre made salads at the commissary. I know I got a long time. So that's what we were really working on. 
Um, but if, you know, if we wanted the dining facilities open, we could, but we just found that the more hours is just more people standing around mm. and then we only had a few people go in there. Uh, I mean, I don't know. It was the last time you went on a Saturday and a Sunday. I made a, a huge splash. I went to uh, Fort Carson and, and they're like, where are we going to eat? Defect. That's where I always go. <laughs> and uh, it was like a Saturday, and there's no way you believe I was in there. A man of the people. Yeah, not a lot of people. I I want to hammer something you're getting after here because I think it's an important message for people to hear. People across the army, across the military, and it's not just a military problem. It's I'm sure it's true everywhere. But people ask for resources all the time, making like with the implication that they can't accomplish something until they have those resources but there are a ton of resources available going unused, right? Defects that aren't as full as they should be in the health and fitness space. We've got R2 and wellness center and MWR coaches and all these things and people aren't using those. And and we're seeing problems now. We're about to talk about H2F in a second, but there's a lot of H2F people that are not getting maximally utilized by the organizations they're in. And, and just for the audience, leaders can't keep giving you more resources if you're not using the resources that are already currently funded. And like DFAC being a big one, the frequency with which I went to DFACs and didn't see any leaders there, only junior soldiers, or I would mention to other people, like the whole time I was a lieutenant and a captain, I ate at least one meal a day in the DFAC, basically every day. And people thought I was crazy because I didn't have to, but the food is, it's good. It's cheap. It's where the soldiers are. You get to talk to them. I don't know. It shouldn't be that hard. No, I'm on your team. Um, and I mean, I would give any leader a coin I saw in the DFAC and I went, if I visited an installation and I was on the installation for a meal, um, it was a requirement, unless you, something weird, I was going to eat in the defect. <laughs> They're like, what do you mean? I was like, yeah, that's where the soldiers are. Mm -hmm. Somebody goes, oh, you're the Sergeant Army. Oh, no. That's the way I've been like forever. I, I, I was well known one time. I got mad and um, I went to the defects division Sergeant Major. And, it, you know, okay, I was mildly crazy. The salt and pepper shakers were like rusted. Mm -hmm. I brought them back to the meeting, <laughs> you know, and the, you know, <laughs> I had a, you know, Sergeant Major Food Service 92 in the headquarters. He was not happy when, you know, the division Sergeant Major throws salt and pepper shakers across the desk in front of the whole staff. I was like, you know, we got to fix this crap. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but, you know, that's my frustration is, is really at the battalion brigade leadership that i mean if it, you know if i could do that that would be your place of duty not your office not on email if it's breakfast or dinner uh lunch and you know go out walk over to the defect as a brigade sergeant major you know i would walk to lunch every day to the defect i wanted to know where my soldiers were eating and if it wasn't good i demanded it to be good where I found, I, where I find battalion and brigade leaderships eat routinely in the deep dining facilities, they're routinely much better. Hundred percent. And I don't want to hang on AFs much longer, but I, I do just want to ask because again, you have a unique perspective here, and and I guess maybe as a transition into the H two F conversation, we're starting to see a world where the physical training and rehabilitation component of the human performance conversation are, are becoming akin to what you would see in a collegiate or professional sport environment, but the nutritional environment is not there. Quite frankly. I mean, we, I think everybody who listens to this has been into a collegiate weight room and sort of the nutri you know, supplements are there. There's a dietitian, you have access to healthy options. Everything's very structured. And you see some of that in the defect with reds, yellows, and greens and that sort of thing. But do you see an army where that level of just nutritional professionalism and access exists? Or are we always going to be butting up against this AFES conversation, this fast food conversation, this choice architecture conversation, because that's kind of just the nature of the beast? Um, I, I do see it. Um, if you go to, um, I'll say first group at JBLM, if you go to first group at JBLM, um, and I talked, Shane Shorter was the first uh, first group sergeant major when I was a core sergeant major who's now a SOCOM. <laughs> so I've uh, known him for a while. They all walked over and they ate the defect. Mm -hmm. So there are places, especially in our special forces, where it's routinely well known that's where you go. 
you get supplements, you get the right meal prep plan. So we have a model. We just got to really um, scale it. The, yeah. We got to get the leaders mm -hmm. doing it. It, it. To me, it's like I said, where I find a battalion and a brigade sergeant major walking over there to that dining facility and they demand we're going to do this. And I, and I agree with you. I went to university of Alabama roll tie boat <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> uh, for a visit. And what really got me is right after the workout, uh, I got a chance to go see one of the practices in the practice field, which is very, very rare. Uh, you had a, a refrigerator and you could get, you know, tart cherry juice. You could get a protein shake. And I said, why can't we do that? <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. why can't I just have that at the grab and go uh, in? I actually wanted it like in the barracks. So that, you know, a meal card soldier who have, um, you know, wants to grab maybe some, you know, yogurt and have his breakfast, um, you know where that's at? We've actually got some of that in Alaska. There's a small grab and go refrigerator in the defect. So I'm sorry, in the barracks. Um, but it just takes a long time and it takes year after year of just pounding it, pounding it. Um, I thought I'd get it all done in four years. I didn't. So I think there still is hope. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I will admit that it takes leadership. Uh, yeah. If you're not driving this uh, from the Sergeant Major of the Army or a Corps Division Sergeant Major, um, it just, you know, it, it's hard for the battalion and brigade commander to get the enough resources to do it. But I'm still hopeful. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sure that Mike Weiber is going to lead through this and others, you know, where he came from, they had that. Why can't we do that for everybody? Why can't mm -hmm. I grab a, you know, a protein shake after a workout? Everybody knows you're supposed to eat 30 minutes afterwards. You're supposed to refuel the body. Um, yeah. This has been, this is documented. It's well documented. Mm -hmm. You just got to do it. So, I, I mean, I think that that's a nice transition into the H2F conversation. And I'm I'm interested, again, in your perspective on this, because having now been, you know, you, depending on who you ask, H2F has been around for a number of years. We'll call it three to five. And programs like that take a long time to mature. And they have a different, I suppose, set of variables that you're looking at when you think of return on investment. I mean, it's it's a human problem that we're, we're dealing with, especially when we get into conversations around behavioral health and cognitive performance and, and that sort of thing. And anybody on the ground will tell you that those types of things take time. How do you balance that with conversations at the highest levels with purse string holders that want to see ROIs that just quite frankly, aren't attainable in such a quick period of time. And you start to see budget cuts and staff cuts in a program that you know is working but it might not just be returning as quickly as you would want it to, as compared to, you know, like the maintenance schedule for a Humvee, as an example. Um, I'm, I'm curious how you, how you navigate that one. Well, I, I'll, I'll tell you from the highest levels, we all believed in it and it was um, like, it wasn't General Hibbert. It was uh, who's the IMT commander. Now he gave us a stat on um, General Klein. Now. Shout out. Yeah General, yeah. General Klein. And when he briefed, he said, when you have holistic health and fitness, you know, we're, you see like a 20% less suicide rate. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're all, you know, I'm, I, I believe in it. And, uh, you know, we looked at how can we accelerate it? And when I left, you know, that was three months ago. I don't know what they're doing now, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> hands off. <laughs> hands off. They took all the money. So we were trying to get, go faster. Uh, yeah. It was, I think it was 10 brigades a year. We said, why can't we do 15? If that's the metrics, let's give them more money to go. You know, with the sticking point, it wasn't the money. Couldn't hire the people. This is a real conversation that people listening to this podcast will understand. There are not a thousand strength coaches waiting to get hired in this country. This is a legitimate, huge splash for the industry. Well, they'll tell you they want to get paid more, but I think that it's, it goes both ways. I mean, it's, you know, like you said, there's not enough people, but yeah. yeah. So we were you know, giving money and we were, you know, believe it or not, you know, everybody likes to blame the, you know, the people that own the money. It actually wasn't the problem. We gave, I forgot the installation. We gave an installation money and they're like, yeah, but we can't hire the people, mm -hmm. uh, but they had the money. We, we've seen that it works. I said, again, I, the list of things I didn't get done. 
I said, why couldn't we, if soldiers are getting out, you know, why couldn't we have a career skills program that gave them all the qualifications to be a strength coach? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, we, we can't hire enough people. This person needs a job. Why don't we recruit our own people to do strength coach? We'll give them the certification, send them to the school. Um, I, I clearly didn't get that fish, finished either, but it was, it was normally not the money to go faster with the people for holistic health and fitness. It was getting the people hired uh, to do the job. And it was just like, okay, you know, we really want them. We've seen it work. Um, that's number one. But number two, um, you know, the leaders got to buy into holistic health and fitness. And I mean, that's why I was pushing so hard to get the ACFT. I mean, I mean, I, I really did lose some hair on that one. That was my new four letter word. Let me tell you, probably one of the more difficult things I've ever done to get something through in the army. I didn't realize that, but, but the, the whole point of that is um, we've got to, to change the culture, you had to change the test mm -hmm. um, and, and to get people believer believers in that. But some people did, I, I'll go general Carilla, CENTCOM commander. He's 82nd division commander. He, he's like, Hey, I, I believe in holistic health and fitness. And he put his medics over there to be, you know, he put his dietitian over in one area. So he'd already built all this stuff without any of the resources that the, you know, the army didn't give him anything. He said, I believe in this. We're going to do it. And um, some people wait for the army to do everything for them. Other people go, I can do a lot of this right now. I believe in it so much. I'm going to do it right now. And General Crowe was one of those people that did that. Um, and I, I used myself when we were, you know, first core, we were like, you know, we, we, we had, you know, these fitness lockers everywhere. <laughs> this is before we knew we we're going to the ACFT. So you go there now, they're, they're like, how did first core get all this? Well, we, General James for seventh ID with Sergeant Major I Love, we just had already gotten ahead of all of it. So leadership still matters. Uh, but most of the time uh, when I left, it wasn't the money. It was just getting the people. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll shout out a couple of things in there that are worth noting that you might not even have seen from your level. There, there definitely are soldiers now doing their career skills program with H2F strength and conditioning staffs and various other members of the team. That opportunity exists. It's pretty cool. I do think people sometimes underestimate what it takes to be a strength and conditioning coach for H2F. To be a coach at all on a team, a lot of patience. You have to have, you have to have your bachelor's degree, you have to have your CSCS, and you have to have experience in the industry already multiple years. If you want to be a brigade lead, you probably have to have a master's degree additional experience. These are, these are not people who just went and got a personal training certification. There's some serious training that goes into that. And I will also say that those coaches love eating at the defect, particularly for breakfast. They know how much they're getting for their money. It's cheap, man. But what I'll ask you is, and this goes back to like leaders embracing H2F and some of the challenges that come with integrating civilians and contractors into a brigade that might not be used to that kind of thing. So some organizations, some leaders have definitely seen the introduction of strength and conditioning coaches as a threat to traditional NCO physical training roles. I don't know how much you bumped into that, but I would love to hear what your advice is to leaders for navigating that new relationship. Yeah, I've heard this a uh, little bit. And uh, I, I usually tell people it's pretty simple. Um, you know, if you give your authority away, you gave it away. Nobody took it from you. <laughs> it's like... This the strength coaches, you know, are phenomenal assets. Um, the the dietitians are great assets, but it doesn't take away your authority to to put together a PT plan for your your soldiers. They should help you. They shouldn't be doing it for everybody, and they we don't have enough of them to do it anyway. It's like you know, how many are that brigade? So there's no threat to NCO authority unless you just gave it away. Um, that's kind of how I feel about it. If you give it away, you should be fired and kicked out of the army. Um, you know, you know, repeat that, play it a couple of times and then send it out. But, uh, <laughs> I, there should be no threats. Like you said, it takes a long time to do this. Um, it takes a lot of expertise. Um, those people are there to make you better and make your unit better, not to do your job. And, and actually, I, that's where I think it's not as efficient where they, they want, you know, this limited asset to come down and do their PT plan for everybody in the brigade. And you just don't have enough of those to do that. It's insane, but that's how I feel about it. There's, there's no, 
losing of uh, authority. Um, you know, unless, like I said, you know, you just give it away. And like I said, you probably shouldn't be an NCO anyway. Well, I mean, we've taught that is something that has come up quite a bit because you mentioned having a hard time hiring folks and you'll hear about, oh, I don't get paid enough or I don't feel like I get to coach because there's this NCO role where leading PT is kind of like a critical skill acquisition mechanism. Um, and, and Alex and I, I think have mentioned this a couple of times and we've had guests talk about it too. It's just, I think it's just a reimagining of the role of what a strength coach traditionally or truly is, because I mean, you've been to Alabama, you've seen the role that those guys play. It's a loud weight room, yelling, screaming, coaching, instructing, programming. And there's elements of that in this army role. But I think what we keep arriving at is that it's, it's a lot more educational than I, I think most certainly young coaches are prepared for, but even older coaches realizing that, Hey, like you mentioned, there's one of me and there's, 2000 of them, I could sit here and, and type in back squat reps and sets all day long, or I could create a curriculum that kind of empowers them to, to take what I know and, and go forth and, and create success. So it, not a question there, but it'll be interesting to see what that landscape looks like in the next couple of years, I think. Yeah. I mean, really, if you've ever played sports, you know, there's, uh, you know, the line coach, <laughs> you know, there's the yeah. back coach is the quarterback, you know, usually one, you know, just a couple of those, but we're still a quarterback coach. You know? So we don't have all the coaches like that. I mean, but, um, but you got, that's where the NCOs go in. And, but you have somebody that is an expert in that area, helps you develop the plan and make sure you're doing it right. And then, you know, I look at the NCOs maybe as the, you know, the line coach or the, the different coaches on a team mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that help them with those areas. Like you said, you know, one per 2,000 just this isn't going to be enough anyway. Right. So we just got to be smarter about that. Um, and and be honest, where I've seen it work really well is where, you know, they all work together. It's not your job, my job. It's our job. I've, I've seen some really good programs. And, you know, I, I would always do PT uh, with units and they always try to kill me. Uh, most of the time they really do need to, you know, go with a coach. My favorite one was like, yeah, <laughs> you know, we're going to do, we're going to like seven cycles. And one of the events in the cycles was we're going to do, um, I think it was like 10 minutes of like those or five minutes of like those. I said, uh, did you rehearse this and you run this by anybody? <laughs> like, no, we did. We did a full rehearsal. I said, I think I'm pretty good with leg tucks and I max them. And I can't do like five minutes of like those. There's no way you did this. No, we didn't. I'm like, no, you didn't. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, you're, oh, you're, you're just trying to kill me. Yeah. And oh, by the way, I'm the only one doing it. Everybody else is just sitting, standing on the ground. So, um, yeah, yeah. There's, there's, we got a long way to go in uh, fitness. Maybe it's all fixed in three months I've been gone. Yep, we fixed it all. You fixed it all. Yeah, you got it. It's Dr. Like, East is writing a book on it right now. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> you know, there was no taking away authority. There was plenty of work for everybody. Sure. I, I don't think that is um, getting away from NCOs. I keep finding myself underlining comments you're making that I hope people are hearing, but I think there's there's a message to both sides of the NCO strength coach relationship there. For NCOs, don't perceive the coaches as a threat to your authority. You have plenty of work to do. But also for coaches, and I think this comes back to like the the art and science of contracting and how we communicate contracts and how the contracting companies hire people and things like that. I think a fair number of coaches, especially early in H2F, were hired under the impression that they were going to walk into a weight room just like they would at a football program and they'd be handed a clipboard and a whistle and they'd work people through squat racks. And it's just a different world here. That's, that doesn't make it better or worse. But I think we, as this spreads out across the army, we can do a better job of communicating what the work environment looks like for coaches. Yeah, we had a big conversation about this. I think it was again, you know, going back to JBLM, is how do you integrate the coaches into the, the army? You know, because we're not always in a, you know, in a gym. You know, I got a lot of time in the field, and how do I maintain some fitness? You know. While I'm deployed into Poland or in Romania or somewhere around the world, there's a lot of ways we can do that. And uh, that person isn't always going to be on that schedule in the in the weight room. It's how do you maintain that fitness worldwide, you know, all the time 
as much as you can. And there's probably not enough gyms, you know, for, you know, one brigade's worth of people on a post. Um, that's why we had to get some equipment, but don't have all. But I agree. I think when we talked to them at JV Limits, like bringing them in and said, okay, this isn't what you just said. You know, it's, it's different. How are we going to work through this? And like I said, where I, I see leaders embrace it, not, hey, these are my people. They saved me. You know, it's like anybody you bring onto a team. You know, you bring them onto a team. Uh, this is a different team. You integrate them. I don't care if it's a contractor, it's a private, it's a second lieutenant, captain, the formerly retired sergeant major in the Army as I'm, you know, going to my new job. You know, you bring people onto the team. They got to be integrated. Here's how we do that. Uh, and I think if you don't do that with strength coaches, then they're confused. And, mm -hmm. and then you get frustrated. Oh, they're not doing a good job. I said, well, did you tell them how the Army works? You know, now we'll run this. <laughs> Just go do great things, you know. Being being respectful of your time, I, I do. There's a, a three part closer that I want to ask you, and I'll go over the whole thing. Well, I need to write this down. Is it like no? Two, I can repeat it as many times as you need me to, and it's pretty. Uh, I mean, it's just like testimony. Are it's, you yes, it and it's pretty cliche and generic. So I think you'll nail this one. But given now that you, three months retired as sergeant major of the army, I, I'd like to know what you think of as your biggest success. I'd be curious what you think your biggest maybe regret slash failure, although that sounds a little bit aggressive. And then just as kind of a fun third arm, if there were no obstacles at all while you were Sergeant Major of the Army, what is one change you would want to make? Ooh. Um, I might you can answer, answer that in any order you'd like. <laughs> I might answer the last one. <laughs> you know, one change, uh, um, I think it, it probably was going on that line that you, we just talked about with nutrition. Mm -hmm. uh, I would want, uh, you know, if I could just snap my fingers right now, uh, man, there's a lot, you know, you know, if I'd snap my fingers right now and barracks, I was gone. Yeah. Barracks was, you know, you, you saw that coming, didn't you? Um, <laughs> believe it or not, it would be in suicide. Mm -hmm. If I could snap my fingers, I really just wish that, you know, soldiers would stop. Um, and we could just, we see somebody having a problem. Um, uh, we'd notice it. We'd, uh, I, my frustration when people go, I didn't know. I said, well, you know, he was perfectly normal, perfectly happy. I just don't think people wake up. It's like me. Oh, I would love my life. I think I'll kill myself. Mm -hmm. That's probably the one I would snap my fingers. Um, but if there was something tangible uh, that wasn't, you know, a human emotion or reaction, maybe, you know, those three, number one, clear would be suicide. Uh, close seconds, probably sexual assault, sexual harassment. Uh, but if it's tangible, um, you know, you know, give me $10 billion and smack, snap my fingers and fix every barracks. Mm -hmm. I just think the two things that I just, you know, really mean a lot to a young soldier is where do I eat and where do I live? <laughs> so, um, and I do want to be clear. Some of that is on the soldiers. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I've walked to a lot of barracks and I lived in the barracks for seven years and I tell everybody, look, I can tell old. And I can tell dirty, you know, and then there's old and dirty. You shouldn't have either, you know, it's okay to have old, but it's really bad to have old and dirty mm -hmm. um, because the dirt part you can fix, clean it. Now the, the upkeep, you know, and um, I'll just let you know, we weren't funding our barracks for a hundred percent of uh, maintenance. I'm, I'm trying to put it in, you know, layman's terms. But imagine that. And I said, well, that's like saying I bought a car. You know what? I'm only going to, you know, fix three of the four tires. Mm -hmm. and that was that was our fan. It was our plan, our model for funding. Um, so before I left, that's one thing I got finished is I asked the secretary, he said, we've got to fund the maintenance of the barracks at 100 percent. If you can't, you could just keep up with the HVAC and not actually get a new HVAC. That's what it kind of meant. Um, so. That was one of those things I think I did, but it, um, I usually don't answer, you know, greatest achievement or, you know, stuff like that uh, because, you know, I didn't do anything. A lot of people, a lot of hard work for a lot of people. I've got a long list of things. I, you know, I'm really proud that I changed the PT test. <laughs> That's not a small thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there had been three other failed attempts. Yeah. Um, one, one SMA was kind of needling me about it. I said, well, you failed to do it. I got it done. Uh -huh. 
Um, <laughs> I'd love to be in that group text. <laughs> I don't think he said much after that, but, um, <laughs> but it, you know, it was really hard, but there's just a lot of things. I didn't do any of that on my own staff. The army um, really helped us out, but there's a whole bunch of little things that I'm really proud of too. It, 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 most people don't even notice it. And sometimes I even forget that I did. So if you look in 600-20 and it says, NTOs are allowed to tell soldiers to do push-ups. I, I mean, I fought, and I fought everybody on that one. The lawyer said no. The IG said no. And I finally went to a meeting with the secretary and the chief, and they, the lawyers both said, we, we don't think you should put that in there. And they said, Sergeant Major, what do you think? I said, well, if you don't start giving your NCOs some authority and you don't back them with this regulation, you know, don't blame them when things go wrong. You know, if something goes bad, I don't want to hear anything about NCOs because you give them no authority. <laughs> uh, so I laid it all on the table. And that's one of those things nobody ever talks about. But it's in there. They may not read. They may not read it. But, uh, but again, it, there's a ton of those. And it was Will Rainier with social media. It was Chuck Albertson um, helping out with the, the body composition and the parent policy. That I mean, we just – I had I had a – I had a really good team. Um, you know, I had the Sergeant Major Iverson, the former 18th Airborne Corps Sergeant Major, Division Sergeant Major, and a longtime 75th Ranger Regiment. That was my XO. And, you know, he did great things. And um, all of that, uh, you know, that's a nice way to avoid your question. There was a lot of things I think I achieved. My biggest regret uh, was not – I always said I wanted zero suicides in the Army. Uh, mm -hmm. And I didn't get there. Um, and people go, well, you know, Sergeant Major, you'll never get to zero. I was like, okay. Well, to hell with me for not trying. Um, I did. I mean, I had a monthly meeting with uh, all the nominated Sergeant Majors in the Army, and we looked at this. And it wasn't just like, okay, I can't believe you had a suicide. It was, what environment did we not do? Did we not pay them enough money? Did we give them a bad barracks? Did we not give them the right food? Did they not get enough sleep? And what resources can I do to, uh, to do that? So my deepest regret, um, un undeniably, is not making suicides lower than it was. Um, mm. Although 22, we had the lowest in 10 years. But my opinion, you know, one was too many and it wasn't zero. So I wish I could have done more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. So we, you said we have 45 minutes. We're right at 45 minutes. I got to ask you one question before I let you go. Cause it determines how we introduce you when we publish this episode. When I wrote all the emails inviting you on here, I used Sergeant Major of the army retired Grinston. And in your replies, every single time you signed it, Tony, how do you <laughs> want to be introduced for this episode? Uh, I'll let you determine. Um, <laughs> oh, put me on the spot. <laughs> no pressure. I, yeah. Well, you know, whatever helps you out. I will go with that. But um, <laughs> the man, the myth, the legend, Tony. Yeah, 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 yeah. Who's that? We don't care. We're not listening. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, you know, really, I, I say this all the time. And, um, you know, the funny part is, you know, I'm going to AER and in January, I'll take over as the first director uh, the first enlisted to ever actually hold the director of AER. Um, it's all been uh, retired GOs. I'll be the first one. And everybody goes, hey, what do, we, what do we call you? I said, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> so, they can't call me Sergeant Major. I said, why would you do that? So I say that, it's, I guess it'd be advice to people. If I put all my eggs in one basket, my whole identity in life you know, ends if you don't call me Sergeant Major. Hmm. Uh, I, I disagree with that. You know, that was just one part of my life. Um, I love being called Sophia and Isabella's dad and Alexander's husband, um, Tony, you know, um, and Sergeant Major of the Army. I am, nobody is more proud of being in the Army than I was. And I still am. Um, but that's not, that didn't completely define me as a person. And my life doesn't end because I'm not the Sergeant Major of the Army. And Biggest advice for everybody. You've got multiple identities. Be proud of all of them. So I like being called Tony. That's what my mom called me. <laughs> so, uh, it's, it's, you know, my mom passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, so I kind of, you know, kind of like it. It's mm -hmm. that's my name. That's what I've been going by for 
that's what my wife calls me. Um, so, but I don't care how I'm introduced. Um, never did. I didn't mean to start major enemy. I said, I always used to say, well, don't screw up the other two. Alexander's husband, Sophia, and Isabella's dad. Call me whatever you want after that. Well, Alexander's husband, tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on this. I mean, like we said at the top, you're far busier than we are. Thank you, number one, for your time as Sergeant Major of the Army. But as Tony, thank you for coming on and having the conversation with us. We really do appreciate it. No, uh, it's been my pleasure. So thanks for having me. Absolutely. Hey, Alex, let's cover our ass real quick. Oh, great idea, Drew. All right, guys. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any entities they represent. Thanks for tuning into this week's episode. Before you go, please rate and review the pod on the listening platform of your choice. You can also visit us on our website at www.mopsinmos.com. Dot com. That's mops, the letter in mos.com. You can check out the library of podcast episodes, our latest blog entries, any helpful resources, and also sign up for our newsletter. Drew nailed it. Just to underline a couple of things, the podcast entries have in-depth show notes on the website. So if you missed anything or you want to read any of the research we talk about, it is all there. You can, at the bottom of the website, sign up with your email and receive future updates from us. The blog posts go a little bit more in depth in kind of written form on a couple of topics we get questions about all the time. But most importantly, I just want to ask all you guys, our best way the word gets out is absolutely word of mouth. So tell your friends, tell the people you work with, anybody you think would find it useful. Thanks for spreading the word. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to shoot us an email at either Drew or Alex at mopsandmos.com. Or there's a contact form on the website. Thank you.